And how can we get them like uh, you can ask me to bring them to you to lecture or you can show up and get them to your section. <laughs> Easiest way is just ask, email me and tell me when to get it, either for a uh, section or for me. No, it's for you. This the next one's for you. Remind me your last name. Okay. Had a I had a conflict before of names. I wanna make sure I get the right stuff. I can do this. Oh man, I got both of these wrong. Well, I, got, I guessed the right one, and then I switched my answer. Oh. <laughs> is this the right one? Uh, no, this is Neil. Oh, I, can, I can do this. Yes, yes. thank you. Finally. Okay. You guys do you want quizzes? I already have one. You have them? Yeah, OK. I'm guessing you didn't circle my section, right? Sorry. OK. Anyone here? Yep. Okay. Remind me a first or last name, something to go by. Oh, okay. Did you circle two? I am the section right before this. Okay. Okay, because I, I have your name engraved in my head. Okay, there you go. I don't know why we don't have a total for it, but it's what's on Stellar. Okay. Coming right up. Three. Yeah. Perfect. You guys have your test, right? Okay. Do you want to test? Last name or something, or first name, something to look. Okay, perfect. Okay, and you're the last person who gets the test before the end of the section. Do you already have it? Huh? Do you already have your test? Yeah. Okay, never mind. <laughs> Sorry, terrible memory. Okay, so who went to lecture? Who understood lecture? There were some interesting parts I can mention on Okay. You, you like blackjack? Yeah. By the way, who knows how to play blackjack? Well, actually, I've heard of these. Do we really? I mean the rules, not like professional not really. count <laughs> card, card so counting. Are, aren't there multiple 21s that are like better than each other and stuff? Uh, you mean, well, house rules. There are multiple house rules. Right. But like when you go somewhere, those are fixed, right? So you don't need to worry too much about those. You just need to understand what they do for your strategy. Like your role is usually pretty much the same. Okay, maybe they don't allow splitting or something, but yeah. your I'm game is usually pretty similar. Well, I screwed up on the 17 in lecture. On the 17? Yeah, because when you have ace, ace 6, it's a soft 17, so you're still supposed to hit when they're showing it to 10. Uh, my table said no. So this was one deck, right? <laughs> yeah. This was one deck, and 17 is a stand for the dealer. Right. Oh, no, wait, 17 is a hit. My my table had a had a stand there. Maybe. I mean, like you could hit, but like at the same time, like you if you're already hit. that high anyway. But when de when dealer shows ten. Oh, the dealer. Dealer has, dealer has, has ten off. Yeah, his. Ten oh, I might have looked at my wrong. Yeah, I might have looked at the wrong one. <laughs> it would have made the game more interesting. Yeah, I should have. Yeah, I should have hit. So, does anyone know? How is the solution in lecture wrong? The solution in lecture has one tiny bug. Did anyone notice it? <laughs> <laughs> the blackjack solution has an issue. I mean, other than the fact that he just keeps on guessing at random cards, we need to stop at a certain point, right? Uh, okay. Well, he does stop in general. There's one issue with stopping. Yeah, there is one issue with stopping. I mean, you can't actually guess more than 11 cards, so. Like you couldn't hit more than 11 in any given round. Okay, so when do you have to stop hitting? Can you get over 21? <laughs> okay, uh, does the lecture code do that? Um, yeah. I 
said, I don't think he mentioned that you would stop if you hit 21 or higher. But okay. It checks if the D goes over 21. It doesn't check if you go over 21. Uh, okay. Uh, I think the lecture notes don't, and the pseudocode that we'll put out today does. There is also one more small issue that we'll go over as we uh, go through the problem again. Okay, so any pointed questions before we go over blackjack? Um, before you start blackjack, can you go through the rules again? The rules of the game? Yeah. Okay. Well, I'm going to do something better than going through the rules. I'm going to abstract the rules away. So I'm going to say that a game of blackjack has, let's start here. So a game of blackjack has a deck. And we have x-ray vision or some other illegal way in which we know what the deck looks like from the beginning. How many cards in a deck? 50. Okay. So say from 0 to 51 because we like zero base indexing. And so the way the game starts is you get two cards, the dealer gets two cards. What is the only decision that you make in the game if you already have perfect information? So you know the deck already. You don't need to wait for each card to know what it's going to be. So as the game starts, you have to make one decision. What's that decision? Well, that's assuming you care what you get each time. So if you have to look at the card, then you have to decide each time if you hit or stand. If you know all the cards in advance, uh, I think our game uh, has that fixed. So it is, it is hit or stand, but I want to restate that. Because you don't actually have to decide after every card if you want to hit or stand. So, you so know what the cards are going to be in advance. Once so to restart, like how many cards? How many cards to take? Yeah, that's pretty much the same thing. So you don't have to decide every time hit or stand. You know ahead of time, I want to hit three times or I want to hit once. Because you know the entire deck. You don't need to actually look at the cards. So each game, the only decision that I make is Suppose this is one game. The only decision that I have is H, how many cards I'm going to hit. Right? And then after I make this decision, the game will eat up some cards. I get two cards, the dealer gets two cards, then I hit some cards, then the dealer gets some cards. And this is the number of cards that have been consumed. So number of cards that were played in this game. And the other thing that comes out of it is how much money I make. Right? For our simple rules, it's either I make a dollar or nothing or I lose a dollar. Fair enough? Everyone follows? So I'm going to abstract all this in a helper method. I'm going to say that I have a method called uh, round outcome. where I say, look, out of the entire deck, I'm going to start at card i. So this is where my round starts. So I tell it which cards I start at and how many cards I'm going to hit. And it gives me back a tuple, where the first item is how many cards are played. So number of cards played. And the second item in the tuple is how much money do I make. H is how many cards I'm going to hit. So I says that I already played this many cards in previous games. So the game, so a game starts with a full deck. And then I play some rounds. Right? Each round, I, I do a whole exchange with a dealer, where I hit some cards, and then the dealer hits some cards, and then I win or lose some money. I'm confused why H and CP here are different from CP. So CP is how many cards were played in total. And this looks at. The initial cards. So first I get two cards, the dealer gets two cards. And then after I hit some cards, the dealer also has to hit. And the dealer has a predefined algorithm, right? So the number of cards played includes the cards that were dealt initially and the cards that the dealer has to hit. 
So this little thing has all the blackjack rules encoded in it. Everything is already there. So blackjack has like roughly 2H, CP is 2H, something like that? I'm not sure. Uh, 4 plus 2H, maybe? Okay, so okay. Because you get two cards, he gets two cards, and if you both deal H on average, then. So CP number of cards played this round, or? This round, yeah. Okay, so intuitively, I already know, so I already know the entire deck. So the decision that I have to make is, would I play optimally every round, or do I want to maybe lose the first round and leave some good cards for later? So I have to figure out how many cards I'm going to hit each time so that overall I make the most amount of money when I leave the table. And when I run out of cards, I leave the table. The dealer, the dealer says, show's over, got to go. Do the rules make sense? OK, so I propose we approach this in two ways. First, we model it as a graph problem, because we've already done this a few times. And then we model it as a dynamic programming problem, and we see how the two are related. Make sense? Is this too simple for everyone? Do you guys already get everything? So how would I model this as a graph problem? So you already know the order that you're going to get all these cards in? Yep. So I guess I get, in lecture, I think really briefly talked about like having your starting node go to a bunch of um, other nodes that uh, would be your potential next move. And then you just calculate the shortest path distance from there to the next node. So that's the general yeah. approach, yeah. right? How do we do this for cards? So what would be nodes? What are what are the most intuitive nodes you could think about? OK, maybe intuitive for me. Um, so nodes show our state, right? Show the state of the, that the game is currently in. Sorry? Your hand? Like your, your current cards. Is that your state? Your choice. Remember, it tells you the drag. So from, I guess, to the ace. From? To the ace. In terms of like the number of choices you have? OK. Uh, well, so the, the problem is you have four, ki four cards of each type, right? And you don't know where they show up and everything. So I think this might make my code more complicated than it needs to be. Like the rest of the cards in the deck that are remaining? OK. Is that a good state? <laughs> How many cards I have left in the deck, right? Yeah. So basically, I would have one node for each of the cards here, and that says, I start a new game at this card. OK, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to draw some circles. Whoops. Say so these are nodes. Maybe I drew a bit too many of them. Uh, where do we always start? The left side. First one, right? We start with 52 cards. So. Circle 0 means that we played 0 cards. We have 52 cards left. When do we draw an edge between nodes? What does an edge mean? It means that's how many cards you've chosen to the number CP. OK, so the number CP, it means I play the game, right? Yeah. So one edge is a game. And it goes from one state to the next state. So. If I'm, say I'm at node i, how do I draw the edges? Say I'm somewhere here. So I already played i cards. Iterate through all h's. OK. So 4 h in what to what? What's the smallest h? The smallest h is 1. Really? Do I have to hit? Oh, sorry. Four, right? no, no, yeah, so I might as well not count them, right? So H is how many cards I hit after the initial ones were dealt. Um, so that I can start at zero. Nice and easy number. <laughs> and where do I end? Rough approximation. I mean, 
you can go to infinity and then break when it gets too far. No, 11. Because 11 at most, oh no, 11 minus 4. 6. You need to know the rules of the game. Okay, if you know the rules of the game, it's that. If you don't know the rules of the game, it's 52 minus 3. Okay, so what's the first thing I do? So how do I draw an edge representing a game where I hold H cards? Oh, can you make go actually never mind. So just you draw an edge from from your current place to okay. the output of round to outcome the zero elements. Alright, so then let's store the this output somewhere. Let's say O is Round outcome. What do I give round out? Round outcome. Um, I uh, and H. Perfect. See, I, I picked good names. They're exactly yeah. what I have there. So I draw an edge from I to what? Um, to the output of round outcome. Or oh, which is O. So O is zero. Okay. The node at O is zero. Yeah. Um, so suppose I'm at I and I already played five cards, right? So say I'm I equals five, for example. And I know that if I hit once, the dealer will also have to hit once. So in total, I played six cards. And suppose I won. Then the output would look like this. Six cards were played, and I won, so plus one. So I would draw an edge from five to what? OK. From five to 11, hopefully. So what's 11? 11 is 5 plus O of 0, right? OK. What am I missing there? Yep. Oh. Okay. So this tells me how many cards I played in this game. I want to look at each game separately. I don't want to have to keep track of previous states. So this output is localized to this game. It tells me how many cards have been drawn in this game in total and how much money I made in this game. If I, if I already played I cards before starting the game, after I play O of 0, the total number of cards is I plus O of 0. Tiny detail, but you'd probably lose a point off on an exam or something if you forget it. OK, so keep track of your state. It, it makes sense to write down, this is my state, and then make sure that you're always representing it. So what's the cost of the edge? And then our answer would be, what path do I want? The longest, the most. Right, I want to make the most amount of money. So that's the longest path. How do I convert this to a shortest path problem? Because this is what we know how to solve. OK, where do I put it? There. <laughs> Good answer. There, right there. OK, so this builds the graph. Then I run some algorithm on it. What's the best algorithm I can run on it? Dijkstra, because you can add one to everything. But you can add one to everything, though. The lowest negative edge wave is one. Or uh, negative one. It's true. There's no negative cycles. That's OK. No, but you can't Are there negative cycles? It shouldn't be. No, everything goes right. It's crazy. Everything goes right, right? So even if I don't hit any card, at least four cards will be played. So. All these arrows go right. So then I heard a fancy term that I like. Can someone say it again? What's this graph? DAG, right? All the edges go one way. So this is a DAG. And that means that I can run what algorithm? Sorry? 
Okay, topological sort plus DFS, the one that we talked about last time when everyone was out for Thanksgiving, right? So you have to believe me that it exists or look at lecture notes. So top sort plus DFS will give me the shortest path in order of V plus E. So this is better than Dijkstra, which is E plus V log V. Okay? Okay, uh, I'm guessing most of you don't know how that algorithm works. Well, good news. We're going to do this using dynamic programming. So we're going to represent the graph implicitly, and we're going to write everything without needing to know the algorithm. If you know it, it helps because you can see how they relate. But if you don't, we should still be able to solve the problem. But before we do that, does everyone understand this? Some nuts would be nice so that I can feel good and Yes, almost. OK. Questions? Okay, so the fifth band, like the number five there, that's only if you hit, right? Or like, so that's the number of cards remaining. Is there a particular reason you picked five? So I was choosing an example for i. So yeah, good question. What does i mean? So this means I'm assume that I'm starting a game. So starting, sorry, around a new round, and I have already played i cards in the previous rounds. So I start a new round, and the first five cards are out of the deck. What's the best strategy I can have? What's the most money I can make? But I mean, like, so there's some notes that connect to the next card over that won't necessarily end the game, so there, there aren't going to be any earnings, right? Uh, right, because you could have five connect to six, and that wouldn't. OK, so here I'm just trying to emphasize the point that all the nodes, all the edges move, all the edges point forward. But yeah, the edges have to go at least across four nodes, okay. right? So assume there are some more nodes around here. Yes. Uh, you're saying uh, you have to be careful for something or else you can lose a point. Uh, or is that in the future? How you draw your edges. Or when we switch to dynamic programming, what you write in your recursion. OK, so last chance to ask a question before we do a conceptual uh, jump and use another algorithm. OK, how would we do this using dynamic programming? So what are we going to have instead of nodes? Sorry? Well, so you still, you still have states in both cases. But here you represent them with nodes in a graph. In dynamic programming, you represent them using, yeah, the states are basically subproblems. And what do we, when we compute stuff, what do we use? numbers in a vector or in a matrix. So there's no graph to work with. There's, there are no extra algorithms to call. We just straight up compute the numbers, which are the answers to the problem. So we're going to have an array. How many elements in the array? Can anyone guess? All right, I heard 52. If I am at element i, say i equals 5 because we used that before, what does this represent in the dynamic programming formulation? It's, it's very similar to node 5 there. So what does it represent? The fact that we're starting a game after we played the first five cards. Sorry, we're starting a round after we played the first five cards. And we want to maximize our earnings from here on. So then the problem is, how do we maximize our earnings starting here? So given that the deck has these cards, 
So the cards from 5 to 51, what's the maximum amount of money we can make by playing optimally? So maximum number of money we can win by playing optimally starting around at card I. Starting at I. So if I want to compute this, by the way, um, Speaking of bad variable names, we did this before. Uh, when people don't know how to name this array, they name it DP. I think we did that in our P set. So this is the most useless name you can have for the array. It just tells you that we're using dynamic programming, but it doesn't really tell you what it means. So we're going to go for it because it's nice and easy to write. So if I want to compute DP of i, how do I do that? OK, so what are the subproblems? Um, the function at i is past 5, where um, the i is calculated to this event. So OK, similar. so I'd want to have something very similar to this, right? Um, what are my decisions? So what are my choices? What do I iterate over? Yep, exactly the same thing as before, right? Starting a node at i, I was starting a node at i here, so the choices are exactly the same. Uh, so I'm going to start by looking at this line. Do I need to make any changes or do I copy it straight over? Okay. So this is the algorithm for computing DP of i. For i in 0 to 52, sorry, h in 52 minus i. <laughs> All right. I mean, I mean, we can actually, we're not going to go through all the cards in the deck. Like, I hope we can do a bit better than that. Yeah, I mean, like, so we know that it's like a max of 6, right? So can we just put that in instead? That's given the rules. Sure. Yeah. If, if you're smart, you can. I'm not, so I'm just writing this. So the, this, fun, this helper function that I have here that I call the magic that implements the rules of blackjack will save me. So if I say that, oh, I want to hit 10 times, and if that's impossible, then it will probably give me an earning of minus infinity, which makes sure I'll never choose that path. All right, so all that is hidden in there. You're smart, you know blackjack, so you can write 6. I'm not, so I can't. So 52 minus i. OK, what do I do next? Do I copy this next line, or do I change it? Yeah, let's copy it over. Sounds good. How about this? Do I copy this? Trick question. Come on, guys. So do I copy this line or not? Do I have a graph here? Can I draw edges? OK, so I'm not going to copy it. What do I do instead? By trick, I mean easy. So what do I do instead? I compute my answer directly. Yep. So if I hit H cards, what uh, what am I looking at? So you need like a function to predict, I guess. Maybe. A so function, you, sorry? You add the DP of DP of O one or O zero or O zero. Okay, so first let's see if I have I cards and say I hit I do the same exact thing that I did before. I look at I is five and H equals two. So then that function gives me the same answer, 6, 1. So then I know that after this, I'm going to end up in a state where I play the first 11 cards. So I'm going to end up at 11. How much money uh, did I make? 
overall. Okay, so one in this case. So, so how much money I made is O of, I think it's O of 1, okay. And after I land here, how much money I'm going to make? Assuming I'm still playing optimally. DP I plus. Okay. So I plus O of zero is used to compute. So DP of I plus O of zero is used to compute DP of I. This is the same thing as. So you're wondering, what the hell, why will that work, right? Yeah. Let's get to that in a minute. That will work. We have to make it work. Yeah. Yeah. So here I'm drawing an edge from i to i plus o of 0. And the cost of the edge is minus o of 1. So here we're looking at edges. Here, I'm assuming that I already computed the answer here using some black magic. It's already available. And I want to compute the answer here. So I have the cost of the edge plus whatever I had here. So if, suppose I know that if I start here and I finish the deck, I can make $20. So suppose I know that this is 20. What will the answer be here? 1 plus 20, which is? Oh, it's just 1. Yep. So if I hit, how many times did I say there? If I hit twice, I guess, I'll make 21. So this is a possible answer. And I have to go over all possible answers. So this is how much I'm making if I hit H cards. Right? Now, I'm looking at multiple choices here. This is the answer for each choice. Which answer do I want in the end? The largest. OK. So let's say I'm going to start with a choices array that stores all the answers. So here I'm just going to append the answer, the possible answer. Choices append this guy. And then at the end of the for loop, I'm going to take the max of choices. And I'm going to assign it where? Yep. So I promised I'm going to compute DP of I. I just finished computing DP of I. Done. Now there's a little problem here. In order to compute this guy, I need to already have the answer for this guy. And maybe for some other guys here, right? So an answer here depends on future answers. The arrows here are the same as the arrows here, right? They represent possible moves in the game. At the same time, the arrows here represent dependencies, right? This answer depends on this answer. This answer depends on this answer, so on and so forth. When we hear the word dependencies, what do we think of? Topological sort. P set, which one? P set six still brings painful memories. Not anymore. We have a new one. <laughs> so, in order to compute this, I need to compute the answer to a few uh, other sub problems to make sure that I have these answers ready by the time I compute this. So, to make sure that this code doesn't crash, I have to compute all the answers to the sub problems in a topological sort order. That's where topological sort fits in here. What's an obvious topological sort if all the edges are pointing this way? Yep. Thank you, guys. So start is the easiest problem. What do you do if you have one card? And then go 
look at bigger and bigger and bigger problems until we tackle the hard problems of what do I do with the entire deck. So when I compute these problems, I'm going to go to iterate how? From where to where? Well, so this is i. Oh, that's i. Oh. So where do I go from? Yep. Do you want to zero? All right. So now whenever I access this guy, I know it's already computed. So the code isn't going to crash. OK, and this thing is my topological sort. So the advantage of this is that the code is a lot smaller, right? Here I'm building the graph, so I'm calling some graph methods, and then I would have to have the code for computing the shortest path in a DAG, and then I would have to have some code for extracting the answer using that. Here, this is all the code. It's a few lines, and it's because the graph is represented implicitly. The topological sort is represented implicitly. The edges are represented implicitly. So this looks like magic, but if you know where to look, you'll find the items, you'll find the things that tell you what the graph looks like. Yes? So that tells you how much money you can make, but does it tell you how you can make it? How you can make it? Not yet. Paired pointers. Paired pointers. <laughs> OK. Yeah, that's a good point. Let me see how we're doing on time. OK. We can talk about parent pointers. Am I missing anything else? There's one decision that I'm missing that I missed here, too. If things look bad for you, if you know you're going to lose money, what can you do? Walk away. Walk away. How much do you get? Zero. Yep. So you always have an edge that takes you all the way out with cost zero. <laughs> right? So. The way I represent that here is I start with a choice of 0. OK, now let's do parent pointers. What's the easiest way of doing parent pointers? Yep, so I want to keep track. For every answer here, I want to keep track of uh, the age that led me to that answer. So in the, in the dynamic programming vector, instead of just storing the maximum cost, I'm going to store the maximum cost and the number of hits I have to make to get there. So instead of having one number here that's 21, I'm going to have two numbers. I'm going to have uh, 21 and the 1 that says you have to hit, sorry, 2. You have to hit twice, and then you'll go on the arrow, and so on and so forth. And if you, if you know how many hits you have to make, you can follow this. You can follow these parent pointers, and they will tell you how to play the entire game. You start at zero and play the entire game. Do do we want to change the pseudocode to do that? Okay, it, it's not too hard. How many people want to see the pseudocode changes? All right, I guess I don't have to write it then. OK, any questions on this? So the change is really simple. You're, instead of storing one number, you store a tuple. And then uh, because tuples are sorted the right way, maximum still works. You don't have to change that. You just have to change uh, what you store down there. So you just add each element into your? Yeah, you add one more parentheses for the tuple. Wait, I already have two. OK, never mind. Is there any difference in making a separate dictionary of parent pointers? Like, does it make any difference running time? Absolutely no difference running time. The code is, um, it might be more complicated. It might be more simple, depending on how your brain works. It's easier to patch existing code to add in parent pointers this way. If you're writing new code, it might be easier for you to have a separate dictionary. This is fewer lines of code, though. OK, any questions on this? Yes. Um, can, can, can you, could I generalize and say if you have a topological sort, you can do everything backwards? 
otherwise you should use like minimalization. Is that too um, So actually you're doing it in the order of the topological sort. You're not doing it backwards. Oh, okay, sorry, yeah. In the order, if you have a topological sort, then you should do it in that order. And then, yeah. But if you don't have a topological sort, then you should do minimalization. If you don't know the topological sort. But there has to be one, right? Because otherwise you have infinite loops. If you have an infinite right. loop in your dependency graph, then you're not going to have an answer. So it means your DP formulation is bad. Fortunately, for all the problems that we have, it's the topological sort is pretty obvious. It either grows from 0 to the problem size or the other way around. So then, like, memoization is... So memoization is it's more of a proof of concept thing. It shows you that if you have the recursion, everything else can be done automatically. So like if you build a graph, then you can run top sort and get the answer. You don't have to think about it. We think about it because the code is smaller if we do it, if we do it this way. If I'd have to write memoization, I would add four or five more lines, right? Mm -hmm. But the point of doing it that way is all you need is that recursion. If you have this, so this is the magic part. If you have this, so this line here of what your choices are and max, how you combine them, then everything else is mechanical. Once you solve enough problems, everything else is just follow the process. So this is the equivalent of in graph problems. The hard part is figuring out what the state is. Once you know what's a state, you know that these are the vertices, and you know how to draw edges between them, and then you know what algorithm to run. So the hard part is still knowing what the state is. Anything else? So this is dynamic programming, smaller code. This is the graph approach. It, they essentially compute the same thing. This is more code. This is less code. And if you see the correspondence between them, then you understand the problem, the problem a little bit better. The main point is when you have a new problem, you can approach it either way. If you see the dynamic programming solution right away, write it down, you're done. If not, draw the graph, think of what the state is, draw the edges, and then after that, you can write the math. OK, let's talk about a new problem. Let's talk about the problem that shows up on interviews. People excited about interviews? OK, suppose you have a sequence of numbers. I'm going to draw a sequence here. And you want to find the shortest increasing subsequence. So you get to choose some numbers out of these numbers, and they have to form an increasing sequence. So for example, this is a sequence. It happens to be increasing. This is also a sequence, but it's not increasing. So it's not a valid answer. And I want the longest sequence that the longest subsequence that is increasing. Does the problem make sense? Um, how do we solve it? Do we want to solve it using dynamic programming or using graphs? OK, so votes for dynamic programming. <laughs> votes for graph? Oh, too bad. It looks prettier as a graph. So how would we solve it as a dynamic programming problem? What are the sub-problems? The largest sub-sequence of the remaining. Starting somewhere, right? Uh, I th I'm going to go off that answer because I know how to go off of it better. Uh, so say I start here, right? Say I start at 4. Or actually, say I start at uh, 3, right? I have two choices, 5, which is closer to me, and 4. Well, I have a few more choices, but they're further away, whatever. So these are my choices starting at 3. 
if I decide that I'm going to go from 3 to 4 and the next number I choose is 4, now I want the longest subsequence starting at 4. Right? It still has to be the longest subsequence. So from here on, no matter what happened before, my behavior still has to be optimal. If instead I, chose, I choose 7, I don't care what happened before, the behavior still has to be optimal. So a subproblem says start at number i. So starting at number i. By the way, we're going to use 0 based indexing again because we like it. So starting at number i, what's the longest increasing subsequence I can get? So the length of the blah, blah, blah. The length of, you get the point. OK. So I'm going to have an array again, right, which stores the answers. The array is going to be named dp. OK. If I have n numbers, I'm going to have n elements from 0 to n minus 1, right? Suppose I'm at element i. And suppose this original array is called a. I'm in the mood for good variable names today. So how do I compute dp of i? Let's write some pseudocode for it. So what's h? Um, the number of like, steps you want to take to the next number. So if I'm going from 3 to 4, h would be what? OK, so I'm going to have to do additions and subtractions. And this is going to confuse me. <laughs> so how about I propose this? What you say is perfectly valid. But instead, to make sure I don't make too many mistakes, I'm going to look at the number I land at, at the index directly. So I'm going to say I start at i, and I end at j. So the next step is j. And then your h is j minus i. So I'm not going to look at the number of numbers I hop over. All I care about is, where do I land? So what's the next number in the subsequence? If I do it that way, where do I start? I plus one. I plus one to so I can choose the same number twice, right? So plus one to n. And then I'm going to have a choices array here that I start initialize with nothing. And then what's the candidate if I'm at j? So what's the, what answer am I looking at? OK. So if, the, if I'm at i and I'm considering choosing j as the next element, then my sequence will be, my sequence length will be dp of j almost. Plus one. OK. Can I choose all the, can I go through all the j's? Can I go from 3 to 2? No. So if the number at j is greater than the number at i, then I have this new choice, right? dp of j plus 1. What do I do with it? Yep. Stick it in choices. Stick it in choices. Sorry, this is a pen. OK. And afterwards? And by the way, this thing is under the if. OK, and I'm missing one choice this way. What's my default choice? So what's the sequence length if I just stay there? 
one. Oh, yeah. So <laughs> if I decide to not choose anything after three, then I have a number, one. Small detail, again, one of those things that costs you one point if you get it wrong. OK, so I have a default. So I know that this is going to be well defined. And I have all my possible choices. Yes? So it's saying, if I'm at i, and the next number in the sequence is j, what's the longest subsequence, the length of the longest subsequence starting at j? So let's run the DP for this example, actually. Let's get a feel for why it works and how it works. So I'm going to copy it again here. 8, 3, 5, 2, 4, 9, 7, 11. So this is A. And DP is here. Where do I start, by the way? Yep. So I have the algorithm here. How do I, how do I iterate? For i in n minus okay. n minus one all the way to zero. So in this case, we're going to start at eleven, right? The default choice is one. Do I have any other choice? Can I go forward? Nope. So this is going to be 1. Now for 7, my array of choices has a default of 1. And then for, let me write the indices too, so I don't get confused. 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And these are my i's. So we're at 7, i equals 6. For j equals 7. Is a of j greater than a of i? OK. So then 7, 11 is a possible choice, right? So if I choose 11 as the next point in my sequence, what's the total sequence length? 2. And 1 plus dp of 7 equals 2. So this is good. So far, the answers add up. So I have 1 and 2 as my candidates uh, for the answer to dp of 6. What's the maximum? All right. Works so far. How about 9? What are the possible answers for 9? So what's choices? First, there's 1. There's always 1. And then for j equals 6, will the if be true? Nope. I can't add a 7 after a 9, right? So go to the next one. For j equals 7, will the if be true? So this append will happen, right? What will be appended in the array? And this means that if I'm at 9 and then the next element is 11, the longest sequence I can get has length 2. OK, what's the answer for 9? So if I start at 9, the longest sequence I can make has length 2. Let's look at 4 now. What is? Well, it, it, just in general, that's, that's the problem is defined as, OK, in this case, you go from 9 to 11. Or so, do you have to go from 9 to the next element? Oh, no. So this is the longest subsequence if I do. So the longest subsequence I get overall. I don't have to go to the next element. Okay. So if my problem looks like this, right. what's so the, the best answer? Is defined as, wait. So the problem is defined as, this is your first element in the subsequence. What's the best answer you can get? I mean, I thought in that case it would be 1 because there's nothing following it that's greater. But OK. This Unless is greater, it right? skips. All right. So it's a subsequence, not a substring, which means you can skip. OK. I hope I got these right. So yeah, you can skip. Otherwise, the answer would be a bit easier to compute. OK, how about 4? So let's start with 1, because that's the easy one. And then? 
gonna be three for that one. Okay. And three for this one. Three for this one. And then two. So all these are bigger, so all, all of them are possible next candidates. And these are the sequence lengths that I can get if I choose them. Final answer? Three. Three, three. three maximum. But for, but for setting the parent pointers, you'd want to pick the closest thing, right? As long as it's a maximum, I don't like, care. Well, so, I, so what are possible parent pointers here? Yeah. The twos, right? Yeah. So either this or this. Do I care which one I choose? No, I guess you don't. As long as I choose a two. From a three, I know I have to go to a two. I can't go to a one, because otherwise it wouldn't be as long as possible. And then from twos, I have to go to a one. And I don't care which one. OK, okay how about two? What's, the, what's DP of two? Does everyone else see it? So these are all possible choices because they're all bigger than two. And I get one if I don't choose anything, four, three, three, two. So four is the biggest answer. Let's look at this one. This one's a bit interesting, five. So what are the choices here? One, if I don't look at anything else, then there's a three for the nine, a three for the seven, and? and a 2 for the 11. So this if is going to skip these two elements, which I can't use to make a, an increasing subsequence. And then it's going to look at these ones, and it's going to add 1 to the numbers here. And I get 3. OK. What's the answer for 3? And what's the answer for 8? Right, the choices are 9 and 11. Well, starting with itself and then 9 and 11. So now what's the longest, what's the answer overall for this problem? So it's not DP of 0, right? Before, when I had blackjack, I knew that I have to start at the first card. So the answer was DP of 0. In this case, it's not DP of 0. It's the maximum of all the DPs here. Right, because I can start my sequence anywhere I want. So I have to take the maximum, and that's the overall answer, which in this case is 4. OK, does it make sense now? Somewhat? So if you don't understand, please look at how you'd represent this as a graph. The idea is that the numbers are nodes and the edges. You draw an edge between numbers where the first number is smaller than the second number. Write that. Write that formulation. Write the shortest path for that, and see how that matches to this. And otherwise, good luck with the P-set. Should be fun.